Good morning from Helsinki, Finland, and welcome to today's event. Tackling root causes, halting biodiversity loss through the circular economy. We have a new Citra publication quantifying the relationship between circular economy and biodiversity, which we're happy to share with you and also hear thoughts about. My name is Malena Sell. I work at the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra in our Circular Economy for Biodiversity team. And I'll be your moderator now for the upcoming hour. Climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and overconsumption of natural resources all pose great threats to the planet and our society at large. The good news is that these challenges can largely be solved by tackling the same root causes related to how we produce and how we consume materials in today's linear economy. What we need to do is shift to a circular economy. And that is what we're here to talk about today. The Finnish Innovation Fund Citra is an independent Think Do Connect tank under the Finnish parliament. Our areas of work cover democracy and participation a fair data economy and sustainability solutions. We also work on foresight and training. As part of all this, we've been working to find solutions to help tackle planetary crises for many years. From leading work on the world's first circular economy roadmap here in Finland, to starting the World Circular Economy Forum. And in fact, today's event is a side event of the World Circular Economy Forum. And the main event will take place in Kigali, Rwanda later in December. So do stay tuned. And now we'll move directly to my colleague, Tim Forslund, who has been really the leading force behind our new study. So the floor is yours, Tim. Thanks, Malena. Uh, well yeah, again, apologies for the technical issues. Is um, I just want to say that it's really great to see so many people here today. And when we started this work last year, there was next to no information about how the circular economy and biodiversity are connected. But since then, the interest in this topic has virtually exploded. And um, I think that goes to show not just how important biodiversity loss and looking at biodiversity is, but also how important the circular economy is from um, as a solutions framework. And um, today we're happy to provide this missing link. And I'm very grateful to my colleagues with whom we had the great pleasure of working on, on this. So if we want to tackle biodiversity loss through the circular economy, we first have to understand what the circular economy is. In the study, we refer to a systemic approach uh, to production, consumption and materials management that maximizes both value and use and applies regenerative principles. So we see this as something that straddles both consumption and production. And we talk about circular interventions from uh, long lasting design, waste cutting solutions and uh, as a service offerings. And on top of that, we see that this, this reduces the negative impacts, but we also look at nature positive aspects through driving regenerative outcomes in areas under production. So once we had a framework for modelable circular interventions, we then try to select the most relevant sectors from a long list. And we first looked at which sectors have the biggest impacts on biodiversity. And secondly, within these sectors, we try to see in which of these the circular economy could play a meaningful role in tackling biodiversity loss. So that gave us four sectors, food and agriculture, buildings and construction, textiles and fibers, and the forest sector. And um, for these four sectors, we established two scenarios, a business as usual scenario, as well as a circular economy scenario, where we get more value from what we have, reduce our resource consumption, and by extension, we use less land, which leaves room for nature to thrive. And at the same time, areas under production are regenerated. 
And we then compare these two scenarios in BII, so the Biodiversity Intactness Index, which is an indicator of how much of the original biodiversity remains in a given region. And um, we use the model, uh, the model for agricultural production and its impacts on the environment, MAGPIE. In the study, we excluded assumptions about future technologies, and we tried to find and anchor our the data to the research literature that is enjoying the most academic consensus in terms of feasibility, so as to give us a um, scenario that is ambitious, but actionable. How then did we construct this scenario? So, in terms of the uh, main assumptions that we used, we uh, reduced meat consumption and food waste by 50%. And we applied, uh, well, we drove regenerative outcomes in large areas under production, both on fields as well as in, in, in forests. And um, if you look at textiles and fibers, we think we can use, increase the use rate of clothing by 50% and the recycling rates up to 75%. Finally, if we look at buildings and construction, we think that urban areas could take up 38% less land area if we allow for higher urban density. At the same time, savings in construction timber could be reduced by 50% through less strict building standards, demanding less material to be used in the first place, longer lifetimes for buildings, as well as a higher use, a reuse and recycling rate for um, building materials. So, what does this all result in? Taken together, these levers could, for example, spare natural forests in an area corresponding to the size of Argentina. It's a huge area. And the model levers could also free up agricultural land corresponding to one and a half times the size of the European Union. Largely in biodiversity rich areas in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. But also in India, the US and in Europe, you would see significant uh, improvements and a recovery in biodiversity. So what do these large changes actually lead to? I'm happy to share with you our key findings. So, the good news is that a circular economy can tackle biodiversity loss, even if no other action is taken. More than that, the circular economy could enable a recovery in biodiversity to the same levels as in the year 2000 by 2035. To ensure a full recovery, however, we would need conser conservation and restoration efforts to work in tandem with our scenario. However, without the circular economy, much of the most urgent consumption-driven biodiversity loss could not be averted. You can reduce the pressure and protect one area, but if the total pressure on nature remains the same, there's a risk that these, this pressure simply risks being shifted elsewhere. Secondly, meat will of course continue to play an important role in years to come. Nevertheless, where we see the biggest contribution to our scenario is in a shift away from the expansion of animal intensive protein sources to um, less input and land intensive alternatives, which by design, um, well, help us design out waste and also pollution. Thirdly, the measures also help uh, tackle climate change. So it's really important from a climate change, climate mitigation point of view. For example, methane emissions in agriculture could drop by almost 90%. More than that, a circular economy can also build resilience by reducing our exposure to and our dependence on sensitive raw materials, as well as volatile commodity markets and fragile supply chains. As an example, in our scenario, we uh, have a 20% reduction onto, well, of fertilizers 
onto croplands in line with the EU farm uh, to fork strategy. So the report thus confirms that the circular economy can help tackle the three facets of the triple crisis of biodiversity loss, climate change, uh, pollution, while at the same time building resilience. So in this figure, you can see how biodiversity is lost from 2000 to the year 2050 under a business as usual scenario. So that is uh, the black line that's sloping downwards. The contributions from the circular economy at the same time are aggregated and you can see that together they can bend the curve on biodiversity loss. So if we zoom in on these sectors in more detail, you can see how, for instance, in the food and agriculture sector, which contributes 73% to our scenario, that's underpinned by a shift to alternative proteins, regenerative agriculture, and also uh, reductions in food waste and loss. In the buildings and uh, construction sector, there's a, another 10% that's added to our scenario. And this is um, due to um, many different things by extending the life cycle of of uh, buildings by using less building materials and increasing the reuse and recycling rate of building materials. Together, these help offset the negative impacts that you have from using more wood material that we have in our scenario. So we predict a 6% increase in the demand for wood timber in our scenario. And still, we can have the impacts being positive for biodiversity. Finally, in the... Um, textiles and fibers sector, there's a reduction in the demand for textiles enabled by circular business models, which increase the lifetime of textiles as well as the use rate. So making sure that textiles are used as much as possible. And also we increase the recycling rates, which if we talk about clothes, for instance, should be uh, take the form of garment to yarn or garment to garment recycling as far as possible so that we maintain as much of the value as possible in terms of um, the textiles. So what then are the implications of the study? In the report, we have specific messages for different, um, well, for businesses and policymakers. And if we talk about businesses, for instance, we you can start by first measuring the dependencies and impacts on nature and you can prepare for setting science-based targets for nature for which circular economy serves as a key delivery mechanism. Overall, however, I would like to share four key implications. Firstly, the circular economy should be harnessed as a tool for halting biodiversity loss broadly. And if we talk about EU policy, for instance, uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan and the Biodiversity Strategy and their harmonization, that's of course essential. But the same circular lens also needs to be applied to adjacent policy areas. So as is being done in the farm to fork strategy, for instance, and we need to talk about a circular bioeconomy as well. In fact, biomass is really central when we talk about biodiversity loss. And I mean, as it drives 85% of land use related biodiversity loss, which is a huge, huge share. So we need to use this resource really carefully and reserve it for high value applications such as chemicals, pulp, fibers, and uh, building materials. Uh, and in line with this message, China just, um, published in January their 14th five-year plan, which includes references to synthetic proteins. So we need to accelerate this shift to alternative proteins as well, since that has a very large potential to turn what is currently outsourced biodiversity impacts to biodiversity-friendly exports. And in my opinion, this is an area of, if we talk about policymakers and businesses, uh, we have specific messages, but this is an area, so alternative proteins and food waste, where I think people in their everyday life can already make a meaningful contribution to halting biodiversity loss without knowing all the details of our report. Finally, these and other solutions that effectively help tackle biodiversity loss as well as climate change, so both reducing emissions as well as a total pressure on nature. Such solutions should be prioritized. 
protecting nature locally and ensuring sustainable production and value chains, that's of course really crucial. But if we don't at the same time reduce the overall pressure on nature, there's a risk that the pressure simply risks being shifted elsewhere into other regions and, and geographies. So we may not be able to solve this problem at a global level then, if, unless we do both. And this is why the circular economy through its systems level approach is so essential when we talk about uh, biodiversity loss as it tackles some of the root causes. Finally, we don't have much time and we have to focus on the solutions that help tackle multiple crises at once. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. Excellent and so inspiring. At this point, we're going to see if we can get Johan back again. So Johan, please, the floor is yours. Elena, and, uh, and thanks, Tim. I hope you can hear me. Let, let's see if it works this time. And, and I think you should just load up the, the, the slides again. And, uh, and let, let me start, um, which you may have heard already in, in, in the last round, that, just congratulate Citra for this really important study. It is uh, incredibly timely, just as you point out, Tim. We have so much scientific evidence of the global, potentially catastrophic risks we're facing. The urgency is tremendous. We've entered a decisive decade of humanity's future on Earth in the sense that we need to bend the global curves, not only on emissions, but on all planetary boundaries, cut emissions by half by 2030, to be you know, having a chance of a safe landing within a safe operating space by, by mid-century. And um, if we take up the slides, if this can work, that we, we know that um, the evidence today is that it's the linear production systems over the last 150 years that have taken us into the Anthropocene, that we're now the dominating force of change on planet Earth. We are today uh, exceeding the forces of change from external natural variability like geological forcing, solar radiated forcing, earthquakes and volcanoes, we are today the driving force of impacts and shifts of the life support systems on Earth. And we must therefore really explore what are the acceleration points for transformative change. Now, the challenges we're facing is not only as the entry point of this CITRA study, an ecological crisis with uh, the sixth mass extinction of species. We're also in the midst of a climate crisis at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. We see the impacts, we see the invoices across the economy. We have the tail end, hopefully, of a zoonotic viral spillover causing a pandemic, which is caused and a manifestation of the Anthropocene of unsustainable overexploitation of natural habitats, which leads to a higher risk of spillover of zoonotic viral disease outbreaks from wildlife by domestic animals to humans. And then all this collides with the geopolitical instability of, of a potential new world order because of the Russian aggression in, in Ukraine, which, which places ourselves in a very bad position because when we need trust and collaboration more than ever, to govern the global commons of which biodiversity forms part as one fundamental commons. When we need that more than ever, we have a weaker point than ever in terms of really executing that. So that is the entry point of, of where we are. We also recognize that um, um, the IPCC now uh, fully scientifically shows that the the uh, only chance we have of holding the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, limit is, is one, a transformative journey, which is shown in this high order statement uh, here. But secondly, also, we need to recognize that the biosphere plays a fundamental role here, that the uh, natural carbon sinks and the ability of the living biosphere to, uh, to provide the ecological functions gives Earth resilience, the ability of the Earth system to remain within a stable climate. So we can no longer separate climate from, from nature. And this is what we are increasingly having scientific evidence from. Um, what you've seen here is the latest assessments 
of the extraordinary stability of the Earth system's climate since we left the last ice age. This is a, a very seminal study by Osman et al. published uh, less than a year ago, showing that um, the temperature range on Earth over the past 12,000 years have been remarkably stable. Actually, a plus minus half a degree, 0 0.5 degrees Celsius of global mean surface temperature over the entire Holocene period. And this is, as we know, the period when we've developed modern civilizations as we know it. So we have more scientific evidence than ever that, uh, that being in the Anthropocene is real drama, meaning that we are leaving the Holocene. And the Holocene is the only state of the planet we know for certain can support humanity. So there's a lot at stake here. And it's, it's more at, at stake than, than only the Holocene because we also have evidence that over the past 3 million years, so this is a study where a physical mathematical climate model for the first time has been able to run over the entire quaternary period, 3 million years, showing that we never exceeded 2 degrees Celsius. The, the Earth system kept itself at its warmest point below 2 degrees Celsius of global mean surface temperature. That's a warm interglacial. And at the coldest point, reaching 4 or 5 degrees Celsius below the pre-industrial average temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. And then we're in a deep ice age. I call this the corridor of life, a very narrow range which the Earth system has stayed within for the entire journey of, of the configuration of the Earth system as we know it today. The question, of course, is why has the Earth system stayed within this very narrow range? Well, we understand that today, that it's not only because of gentle external forcing from uh, uh, orbital forcing from the sun. Oh no, it's also the living biosphere. It's also the feedbacks and interactions of how the biosphere functions. This is data from the IPCC six assessment proving this point, showing that 56% of our emission of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning have been absorbed on terrestrial intact ecosystems on land and in the ocean. The world's largest free subsidy to the world economy, a geo-biophysical buffering attempt of the Earth system to remain in the basin of attraction in the equilibrium state of the Holocene. So a healthy planet with healthy biodiversity will apply its biogeochemical processes to buffer and dampen stress. And the stress point right now is disturbance on climate change. And so far, it has been successful. The problem is that we're starting to see cracks in this system. We're seeing more and more evidence that already approaching 1.5 degrees Celsius, we are at risk of losing these um, buffering uh, capabilities of the Earth system. For example, we're seeing already scientific publications showing that the Brazilian part of the Amazon has already tipped over from a carbon sink to carbon source. So 1.5 degrees Celsius is a real planetary boundary. It's not something that we can just arbitrarily negotiate around as some form of political uh, compromise. The IPCC 6 assessment actually confirms this by um, concluding that we go beyond 1.5 in our latest, uh, most recent assessment, showing that we then go from moderate risks to high risk, and this means entering a domain where we can no longer exclude causing irreversible changes. This is an assessment prior to the IPCC, but the IPCC confirms this. And that, that confirmation comes from the red embers diagrams. So let me describe this. This is from the latest six assessment of the IPCC. It's the red embers diagrams of risk, showing that for the five areas of concern the IPCC has established, from impacts on ecosystems all the way to triggering tipping points, the range of risk, that's where those red crosses are here, the range of risk has gone down, the left cross down to 1.5 degrees Celsius for impacts on large ecosystems like tropical coral reef systems, but, but uh, is around 2 degrees Celsius for triggering large tipping points. So we have support now from the broad authoritative mainstream IPCC assessments that, that already between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, we enter... Uh, high-risk domains, and that this is related also to the biology on Earth, not only to the physics on Earth. So this is why we need a planetary boundary framework. And here you see in the latest 2015 assessment, 
that four of the nine boundaries are transgressed outside of the safe operating space that gives us a high chance of remaining within a Holocene interglacial state that can support humanity. Those four are, as you know, climate change, biodiversity loss, overloading of nutrients, and land system change. We're now working on the third scientific update. The third scientific update shows that we are um, pushing towards the fringe of six of the nine boundaries. So it's adding fresh water, which the latest uh, publications indicate we have moved beyond the entire range of the pre-industrial um, safety levels for both green water, meaning soil moisture, which regulates biomass growth and all moisture feedback for rainfall, but also blue water in, in runoff in rivers, groundwater and lakes, which is used for all forms of domestic industrial irrigating purposes, but also for aquatic ecosystems. So unfortunately, we will very soon be concluding that we are outside of the safe operating space for six of the nine boundaries, and that the four boundaries that we assessed as being outside of the safe space in 2015 are moving deeper and deeper into the red zone, and biodiversity is the one that is deepest red among these boundaries. So we're truly in a, in a danger zone, and therefore need to move very fast. And we're talking about moving very fast. It's about recognizing that the journey to a safe landing is not only to phase out fossil fuels, it is also about recognizing the need to invest in nature-based solutions. It's about a transformation of the global food system from source to sink, which Tim already talked about. And it's also about maintaining carbon sinks in intact nature. All the climate models that gives us a safe landing in 1.5 within a global carbon budget of 400 gigatons of carbon dioxide assumes that we will be able to also transform the food system and keep intact nature functioning. So, so this is something to recognize. It's a sustainability transformation, which requires a fundamental recognition that you cannot separate anymore biodiversity, or we've never been able to separate biodiversity from climate. This is a study we did in the PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showing that we would have already have crashed through 1.5 degrees Celsius if it hadn't been intact nature, biodiversity on land, just, just terrestrial ecosystems on their own could have jeopardized the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. And we know that over the next five years, despite all the services provided by nature, we are at risk of, of having at least one 1.5 degrees Celsius year over the next five years, a 50-50% risk. So, so we are moving very fast beyond the point of, of manageable uh, temperature levels. So this all points to the need for a, a, a circular economy, a real strategy for transformative change. We have been exploring exponential roadmaps, so not specifically on, um, on, on a circular economy, but looking at um, the food system transition. You may have seen the Eat Lancet Commission work that uh, identifies uh, the necessity, but also the grand opportunity of transforming to healthy and sustainable diets, which would bring um, essentially all of the transgressed boundaries significantly back towards a safe operating space, because the food system is the single largest cause behind biodiversity loss, for example. We have therefore been uh, really pushing for the big transitions we need in the world, which is the food system transition, the energy transition, and, and uh, circular uh, cycles of all forms of, of elements consumer goods and and in the entire production cycle. I just wanted to highlight that there's a lot of momentum here. You have the Earth Commission exploring and, and assessing a safe and just corridor for humanity and looking at transformation pathways. IPBS and IPCC working more closely together within the nature climate agenda and the whole Food Systems Economics Commission today really exploring pathways towards accelerating exactly the journey that, that uh, the CITRA study has been pointing out and, and what uh, the planetary boundary science shows is necessary, which is why there is uh, so much um, need to, to, to really um, emphasize why biodiversity loss must be fundamentally uh, halted.
in this transition because it is the provision that the biodiversity provides the biomes, which in turn provides the resilience of the living part of the biosphere, and that these transformative changes are possible in the food system if we invest in practices that largely are available, which is about um, accepting, number one, zero expansion of land. We simply have come to the end of the road of expanding ourselves into producing more food, but then also investing in, just as Tim pointed out, in regenerative, restorative measures where we can produce more with less in circular methods, while at the same time building up more natural capacity. So to come to, to a close, I would argue that what, what we know from, from this entire scientific, from the scientific evidence base we have today is that we're facing unprecedented risks. We're putting the stability of the whole Earth system at risk. Uh, the climate stress is the most urgent pressure point on the Earth system, but the only way to have a safe landing to be able to keep the Earth system in, a, in, a, in, an, in an interglacial Holocene state that can co continue to support humanity, we need nature. And nature provides us with a buffering and, and dampening capacity. And we therefore should welcome all forms of circular economic approaches, but also nature-based solutions and nature climate solutions while being very careful. Because when doing so, we cannot have, with, where there's a tendency today, companies jumping on the nature-based solutions pathway as an offsetting strategy to compensate for the inability of moving fast to decarbonize the fossil fuel emissions. On the contrary, we need to now recognize that there is only one pathway forward, and that is additionality. Additionality means invest fully in biodiversity, fully on circular economic pathways to, to close the linear production uh, lines and, and enable us to return within a safe space, while at the same time having a phase out on fossil fuel driven economic processes. So fundamentally, the conclusion is the following, that our only chance for having a livable earth system for all future generations is to invest in nature as a resilience building component for life support directly, but also for long-term stability of the earth system. And therefore, I think that what we're seeing today, not only Citra study on circular economy in the biodiversity domain, but also on nature positive, where there's more and more momentum of scientifically defining a 1.5 degree Celsius equivalent for nature, defined as net zero loss of nature from 2020 onward, and having a net positive future by 2030, which aligns very well with the Citra study of reversing biodiversity loss by 2035 in the scenarios in the Citra study, and having full uh, recovery by 2050 is something that is, is gaining more and more momentum, which is so important this COP15 year for biodiversity. So again, um, uh, kudos to, uh, to Citra for this really important study and uh, looking forward to uh, it making uh, a lot of headway and having impact across the policy domain and in discussions uh, across the world. And uh, thank you and over to you. Thank you so much, Johan, for your excellent, very, very wide ranging and overarching presentation that gives us the big picture. Now we'll jump over to our panel. We have three wonderful panelists with us today. Dr. Florica Finkhoyer, who is the Director General for um, the Environment at DG Environment of the European Commission. Um, and then I'd also like to welcome Corley Pretorius, who's Deputy Director at the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center. And finally, I also have the pleasure to welcome Joss Blériot, who's the executive lead for institutions, governments, and cities at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So just to jump into the questions, Joss, I will start with you. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation has played a pivotal role in shaping the idea of and accelerating the transition to a circular economy. The concept of a circular economy is in many ways built around the idea of learning from nature, but it is also important 
for nature. Last year, you published a paper, The Nature Imperative. How do you see the relationship between nature and circular economy? based on your report, as well as what you've heard Tim talk about today. Joss. Thank you, Malena, and, and thanks everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to join forces with Citro once again. Thank you for having uh, accepted our presence in the advisory board of, for, for your really important study, which really pushes the, uh, the, the dynamic of the debate by putting some quantification onto the, the fundamentals of the idea. And, and of course, I'd like to Thank you, Johan, as well, for his ever uh, thought-provoking insights and, and really, really clear statements. I think to answer your question, maybe one thing that could be useful would be to look at the principles of the circular economy as we see them and, and link those to the biodiversity uh, discussion, which, by the way, uh, I, I'll start by saying that uh, the global uh, post-2020 biodiversity framework still does not really uh, recognize the importance of circular economy and that's something that we need to keep on pushing because it is about moving away from the extractive uh, logic that we have in terms of value creation now. So going back to the principles, if we look at the first one, which is about eliminating waste and pollution, well that of course is a way to reduce all the threats to biodiversity when it comes to not putting toxicity in in the, the products that we have or in the processes it's about for instance looking at plastics and their reuse as as a different approach to simply saying no we're going to do some targeted bans which are important but only go so far it's about what we put on the market what's that feedstock the second principle is about keeping those products and materials in use and that's to room, leave room for biodiversity because it, it's quite simple to understand that what you don't waste, you don't need to replace. And that works across a variety of sectors from textiles to built environment. It's about maximizing asset utilization so as not to rely constantly on putting more and more products on the market in order to feed that throughput system. And finally, the third one, which is more overarching and, and really goes to the heart of what we're talking today, is the regenerate natural systems principle which is there to enable biodiversity to thrive and this is about closing nutrient loops it's about making sure that the products that are designed to be compostable to return to the natural cycles can effectively do so which means that there is an important infrastructure dimension here as well we need to collect the right stuff and bring it back to where it should go and this is really a key decision-making component in the public policies today. So it, we could look at the circular economy and its three principles in terms of the feedstock, so both the nature and the volume of what we put on the market, in terms of process, and that includes design, design for repairability, design for recovery, which means that we can keep those assets in circulation and not rely on further virgin extraction. And then, of course, in terms of business models as well, which rely, in, and Tim alluded to it in his presentation, on the provision of services and not necessarily on value being created by selling more and more volumes of stuff. I'll, I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joss. So now we'll move to Coralie. You and your colleagues have also helped guide us in the work on this study. You launched this concept of bending the curve, where you look at the need to combine efforts both to conserve nature and also to transform production and consumption, especially in the food sector. Could you, tell, could, could you please tell us a little bit more about your work and how that also relates to the study of today? Thank you very much, Melina. Yes, of course I can. But first, uh, I would also like to extend our congratulations to Citra and the team for this report and for the modeling, very complex modeling that they have achieved here. And it's, a, as um, others have said also, it's a great step to get this quantification um, out for to inform policy making and, and to exactly have these discussions. So well done to the team. We also appreciated the opportunity to be part of the advisory group that supported the study. Um, just in terms of your question of, of bending the curve and 
I realized this has become a, a shorthand that we use for a paper that was a modeling work that was uh, developed earlier. And it basically models the loss of biodiversity over time. So we have a line going down saying we're losing, losing, losing biodiversity. And then we looked at what are the solutions to help that loss of biodiversity to reverse it, to make sure that we have that safe operating space that Johan Rockström was talking about. And basically the conclusion of the, the research was that we cannot rely as much as they try to on our ministries of, of environment and on protected areas alone to provide us with that safe operating space to um, reverse the loss of biodiversity. We do need to think and look at how we consume and produce. And this links back to the basic drivers of biodiversity loss, land use change, climate change, as Johannes explained so, so eloquently, pollution that you just, just referred to, but also over-exploitation of species and the introduction of invasive species due to uh, habitat disruption. So what the bending the curve work says is we need all of society, all of the sectors, especially the high impact sectors, to contribute to positive outcomes for nature. And this means really large economic transformations. So this is what we are going to do, what we need to, to support in terms of the uh, new policies, but also the adjustments that businesses need to do to transform the way they produce as consumers, all of us need to think about more sustainable lifestyles, to think about the, the products that's available, but also how we um, consume and eliminate waste. I'll stop there and I'll come back to some of the points in subsequent questions. Thanks. Thank you, Coralie, for, for that. Very interesting and, and also showing the breadth of, of the issues at hand here in your answer. Now we'll move to Florica. So, of course, you can provide us with a European perspective here from the EU side. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the European Green Deal is covering a number of different sectors and it has a number of different strategies that relate to climate change, biodiversity loss and environmental degradation. Could you say more about how circular economy and biodiversity protection go hand in hand? And do you also have perhaps some concrete examples from the EU member states at really the concrete level? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to once see that biodiversity and biodiversity loss is at the center stage because I think it's far too underestimated, the impact, and therefore I wholeheartedly really um, um, pay tribute to the CITRA um, um, study, because it is modeling in the four sectors in which we are also active, but it is also making this cross-sectorial um, uh, combination. And in the department I, I'm serving, it's uh, DG Environment, we really look at circular economy, biodiversity and uh, pollution as being intertwined. And I will give you some examples very clearly on what we are doing at European level, but also, of course, where it goes to the member states. But when we put forward now regulatory frameworks, we also do hope that it gives incentives for member states. And actually, it's sort of, it's actually becoming, if member states agree, also an obligation for them. But it is also um, giving clarity, and I have to say that very uh, clearly, clarity, predictability of the regulatory framework for the industry, because industry has to undergo fundamental changes, including the agricultural industry. And that's why I, again, commend the CITRA study, because it is business oriented. And we can talk a lot about natural capital, uh, as long as we don't show that there are bankable projects coming out of it, people do not really believe in it. Now, I have to say from the European point of view, circularity is a cornerstone. And in the proposals that we have put forward uh, lately, um, not only under the Circular Economy Action Plan, but in general, we always uh, use very much uh, circularity as the enabler mechanism. You saw it with single-use plastic, with batteries, with waste shipments. It was all about basically um, 
stopping overconsumption, overproduction, keeping uh, materials within the internal market so that we can reuse, first of all, of course, prevent, but if not, reuse and then recycle on different variations. And you know these um, um, principles that we have put forward. It's very much also of reusability, repairability, and so on and so on. But it's very much about lowering the carbon footprint, the environmental footprint, but also the um, pollution footprint and lowering the material um, uptake. And all of this is basically a green industrial policy. And I have to say that with, unfortunately, with the war in Ukraine, the concept uh, of uh, circularity has been understood differently or better by some who were perhaps not believing in having to act because we have planetary boundaries, because everybody now understands you have supply chain problems, you have dependencies that you have to cut, but you also have to go for strategic autonomy. So this concept of circularity is really now sort of seeing a boom. What is not seeing a connection was circularity and biodiversity. And that's why I'm extremely grateful because we have these three real conventions this year and they all should look at biodiversity. The UNCCD one, on, which already took place on uh, drought, the one in Sharm El Sheikh on uh, climate, but also the one which we hopefully will still have this year on biodiversity and halting biodiversity loss. So we really have to go on to that uh, concept. Um, and I have to say also this concept uh, is different in the sense that we in the highly industrialized uh, um, nations do use up our earth um, uh, materials at a much higher rate, 1.6 earths we are consuming basically every year, uh, then uh, middle income or even least developed countries. So there is also a responsibility for us. Um, now you asked for very clear examples. I already mentioned a few because we always want to uh, propose uh, lowering this uh, energy, carbon, and biodiversity or material um, footprint, environmental footprint. And we did that in, for instance, in rate shipment uh, by saying we do not ship it out. We rather use the trash, that is cash, inside in order to come to new uh, secondary raw materials, which we absolutely need in order to sustain that, that uh, pace, but also going down on consumption. So um, this this is clearly something. We also go, when we go now on uh, food, food was uh, in previous um, uh, um, explanations quite a, a big um, theme. We will have to go not only on the plant-based uh, diet, but we also have to act on food waste. And that is something which we are now seeing. Also, uh, it was very much called for by the Conference on the Future of Europe. So that's something where we collectively will go into it. It's like with energy efficiency. People understood finally energy efficiency. Now, hopefully people understand that uh, wasting food is not good and we have really a possibility to reduce the, the impact that we have and then ensure better food affordability, but also food security where it is needed. So it is uh, certainly on all of this. Um, let me say also a few things on biodiversity specifically. We will come forward with a nature restoration uh, law now this month. This is about protecting and restoring, restoring mainly, not not, not attracting is a, a wrong word. It's more restoring and maintaining uh, a healthy um, and restored environment for different types of ecosystem. All types of ecosystem can be forest, can be agriculture can be urban, it can be rivers and so on. And this is needed because if we are not, and we heard it already, if we are not restoring and maintaining it to a good healthy status, then obviously uh, we will have more impact from climate change, more floods, more droughts, less food uh, available and so on and so on. And all the spillover effects also on the other economy, because less water, less materials. I mean, that's pretty clear, but people do not talk enough about it. And by the way, nature-based solutions, we finally had a breakthrough in UNEA 5 in Nairobi this year, where we collectively as global community agreed on a definition of what is uh, a nature-based solution. This is very important for making 
uh, headway in the Sharm el Sheikh COP on uh, um, climate change, but also on the biodiversity COP when it arrives, because precisely it should not be greenwashing, it should be about um, really uh, uh, nature positive ones. So this definition was very important. Um, we come forward also with a waste, uh, waste packaging uh, directive, which also will reduce waste and therefore material uptake in all types of packaging. Uh, microplastics we will also look at um, and so on and so on. But you asked me about member states. Member states, of course, will implement once they agree and go through dialogue of the proposals that we put forward, which are so decisive for the transformation that the industry has to go. But the real level of change is going and taking place already now at the consumer level, but also at the regional or local level, and especially in cities. Um, and I give you a few uh, few examples. This is all about making people aware and driving the change. Sweden, for instance, have a strategic innovation program for sustainable and efficient use of the Earth's resources within the planetary boundaries. Sweden is going ahead on that. France, France has since 2020 about 50 measures in a acts of law on circularity, including on supply chains, including on deforestation which, by the way, is also a proposal we put just forward. You have regions and cities that go circular, uh, um, very important. Madeira, for instance, has a circular agenda to encourage um, uh, companies to adopt circular best practices, practices, innovative solutions, especially in the agri-food sector. You have, um, for instance, a circular roadmap in the city of Tuku in Finland, Finland, but also you have uh, the Balearic Islands where you go for circular tourism sector. I mean, you can use the circular approach in all sectors. We start to look at those sectors which has the highest potential of circularity, but also the um, highest potential of, of, of halting really biodiversity loss and uh, stopping or having an effect on not uh, uh, going at ahead uh, with a too high material uptake or extraction of products. We will look at this, especially in the, and that was that I stop, uh, the uh, eco-design and sustainable products regulation. That's a framework, how products, uh, circular products if you want, and sustainable products should be the norm in the Europe in the future. It's a long-term strategy. And then we will have to now look at which sectors, is it steel, is it consumer goods, goods, is it construction sector, where do we go and translate that in specific legislation. So I hope I gave you a little bit an, an, an idea of where we go and that it is a very systemic uh, rollout now of this uh, circular economy approach at European level. Thank you, Florica. This was excellent also in bringing together what's happening in processes at the global level to really what happens in cities at grassroots level. Now, unfortunately, we are running out of time. It would have been lovely to continue discussions. I'm sure we will all do so afterwards in different contexts and um, touch on other issues such as trade, such as global effects of everything that we're doing. But for now, I would like to really thank our wonderful presenters, Johan and Tim, as well as our panelists for all of your contributions to the debate. So have a great rest of the day and thank you from the studio side here and from on behalf of, of Citra as a whole. Mm.